Warning, the following documentary contains images of graphic violence and may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. I will always have a soft spot in my brain for Leatherface. No, get out of here! I was in one of the most infamous horror films ever made. Is there a reason why he's wearing skin? I've always identified with the monster. Every shoot is hard. Take you down right here, cowboy! The filming of this show had its ups and downs. Fuck you, mister! Leatherface is the nail in the coffin of my cinematic innocence. <laughs> I like Texas. Ed Gein was one of the most notorious serial killers in American history. Ed was like the four-star guy before Manson. Everybody knows who Manson is now. Not that many people know who Ed is, but the people who know who Ed is know because he was notorious for being one of the first serial killers who was really jumped on by media. Isn't he the guy that like went and got all those people and cut them up and put on their skin and danced in the moonlight wearing their skin? Almost a stereotypical mama's boy gone gone nuts. There is one absolutely notorious photograph, a decapitated, gutted body that they found when they raided his house. Where the woman's hanging upside down and killed like meat. They found body parts in the fridge, stuff on the stove, a belt made out of uh, nipples. He, he would uh, literally dig up corpses and take various body parts from them. When they apprehended him, he was never uh, violent. He never had episodes. He just uh, had this little bit of aberrant programming. He lived with his elderly mother. So basically, if that all sounds kind of familiar, it was kind of the, the de facto model for Psycho. Once upon a time, a little boy named Robert Block wrote a book called Psycho, and it changed everything. The reason that Psycho is a watershed horror film is because Psycho is one of the first movies to say, the guy standing behind you, that nice, normal, local boy at the supermarket can grab a giant kitchen implement and stab you to death for no reason that you'll be capable of understanding. That was the point at which the monster face became our face. The thing that fascinated Block about Gein was that this guy, who looked completely normal and was a local person that everybody knew, could conduct this activity for an extended period of time without being detected or caught or anybody having any idea that it was going on. He's the horrible, horrible man that, the, uh, that Leatherface is based on. This character was actually founded on the Ed Gein myth. When Toby was younger, like Robert Block, he had also heard stories of Gein. Toby, being a good old Texas boy, decided to transplant just kind of the basic elements of the story to his stomping ground and birth the family from his image of like a solitary murderer doing this. What if we make him a whole nice little post-nuclear family unit? I remember the first time I saw Texas Chainsaw Massacre and someone was telling me about it and I'm thinking this is really going to be unwatchable. But I went to see it anyway and I was blown away. It is and still is one of the most scariest movies ever made. I remember the tone of it was ferocious. It was so real and so kind of unrelenting. It was made during a period of time where there were actually far fewer restrictions on film than there are now. It had that nice, saturated, chromatic 70s film look to it. There's actually very little on-screen violence. It's more a movie of violent tone. It's really like a work of primitive folk art. It was shot in Texas, on real locations, in, a, in an incredible heat, with an amateur crew, amateur cast, all those things that normally you consider that are detriments to a movie were, were total assets to it. It's just a seminal American independent film, forget horror film, I think it's just a seminal independent film. Toby Hooper made a deal with Canon Films so that Toby would do a sequel to Chainsaw. When he sat down to make the sequel, he had more tools at his disposal and more money and more technology. Chainsaw 2 was kind of the movie I was expecting when I first saw Chainsaw 1 because it's wall-to-wall -wall gore. Canon did a very smart thing, I think. They actually released it unrated. The best horror films are really made outside the system. New Line was still a niche genre studio, predominantly known for horror films and for mass market comedies with a bit of an edge. New Line was famous for really finding franchises. The Ninja Turtles, the Freddy movies, they were very much into the horror genre at that point. They had seen the upside and also the possibilities for sequels. Mike DeLuca was new to New Line. He was in love with the horror genre and he was trying to look for new franchises. What one hopes is a predictable revenue stream where you know that there's an audience that if you make a good 
franchise sequel that they will come. Everybody knew that it was a franchise that was important to the fans and that it really could be a potential huge moneymaker. And they knew that by making it sort of commercial that there was a gamble that they were going to take away some of the visceralness of it. And it turns out they were right. We were prepping it without a director. We had a designer, a cameraman, and we were all kind of working blindly. The studio was desperately trying to find the right person to direct this show. I think who they really wanted to direct the movie, even then, which showed good taste on their part, was uh, Peter Jackson. I'd put him up for Nightmare on Elm Street, for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and ultimately it took all these years to affiliate on Lord of the Rings. But it ultimately came down to a short list of two or three filmmakers, of which Jeff was one. I really was like the first guy that they kind of said, I guess we can tolerate him that would accept the job. I'm really an independent filmmaker at heart and in spirit. I'd gone to film school at USC, made a short film there that won a lot of awards. My first movie was just made totally independently. It's called The Offspring, and it starred Vincent Price. Kind of a horror anthology in the vein of Tales from the Crypt, and then uh, we made Stepfather 2, uh, and that was successful. It was supposed to be a made-for-video thing that Miramax ended up picking up, and it went theatrical. Having just done the Stepfather sequel, they said, well, if you could do that, you could do this. I got a phone call in July saying, can you come in to meet? We're very, very interested in you directing the movie. We're totally out of the blue. I got hired like right around July 4th weekend. We started shooting like July 19th. And then it was just run and gun. The frustrating thing doing a sequel like that is the expectation and the idea that the film can't function just as a film, it's got to function as a kickoff to more films. Michael DeLuca knew a writer by the name of David J. Scow, who was known as a splatterpunk novelist and wrote these really great, very scary books. The thought was that we could build a really terrifying script around David that he could write. The idea was to make a really straight ahead, you know, terrifying horror film. New Line wanted it more uh, serious and more nasty. Just kind of tip the hat, but not Xerox the first movie. Hey, got you. Yeah, you got your kid. In some ways, it was kind of uncomfortably close to the first movie. What I did like about it was it was old school nastiness. When I first read the screenplay, I was shocked at how violent it was and how tough it was. Once they said, what would you do with Leatherface? I went back and I watched the first film closely and I said, what are some things that I can draw out of this? and maybe build a new story out of. And the first notion was to get rid of the remnants of the original family immediately because I wanted Leatherface to have a kind of adopted nuclear family based on the idea that like sensibilities had kind of attracted each other. You know, they wound up with this little core group of new misfits. Everybody's inclination was to disregard the sequel. However, the sequel contains the line, the Saw's family which I appropriated for Chainsaw 3, which wound up all over the posters and all over the chainsaw and, and you know, and everything else. All right, Jeff here we go, right, right away. Most of the actors playing most of the main characters were not extremely well-known people. They were all really good actors, but none of them were like big stars. If you see a big star, it sort of blows the whole verisimilitude of the film. The lead of the movie is Kate Hodge. Pretty goddamn good, you backwoods motherfucker. The thing about a scream queen is that you want someone who will not get on your nerves. <laughs> You don't want to say, I want her to go. So you really have to find someone who is sympathetic. She was constantly covered in sticky blood. She was chained up, ah! nailed up, had nails in her hands. Ah! Any way to abuse her, she was abused. I spent a great deal of my acting career getting killed. I was killed by Jason Voorhees. I was killed by Freddy Krueger and killed by Leatherface. I was killed by all of them, except for Michael Myers. I never ran into him. You gotta fry that sucker if they find him. I look good crying and running. <laughs> or holding a crowbar saying, you know, if I don't come back in 10 minutes, climb out the window and run as fast as you can. I'll just drive, 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 Where? Ken Foray, I wanted to put in the movie because uh, I was a big fan of Dawn of the Dead. How many? We don't know, two, maybe more. He had a nice genre identification, and uh, and also he was just physically perfect for it. Sounds like he just a few quarts shy of a full tank, you know what I mean? They were their own terribly dysfunctional, neurotic, crazy, messed up family. We knows what to do with them parts. People who murder people, <laughs> chop them up with sharp things, 
occasionally consume bits and pieces of them. What we need now is a good mess of greens. They're like a sort of a homicidal SWAT team. You had this whole family doing what they consider very normal things, and it's just truly horrifying. Societal sexual norms don't exist. <laughs> Wackos. They were all tied together by the Joe Unger character, the Tinker. If anyone is the brains behind the operation, it probably would have been him. Technology is our friend. Well, the character of Alfredo was played by Tom Everett. I hate when this happens, you know. He's kind of peripheral to the family, but integral to the family. He cleans and he does housework. He's basically kind of like a distant early warning system for him. I'm going to service you real good, ma'am. Get that thing off my cutting board. The character of Mama was played by Miriam Bird Nethery in the movie. She passed away this summer. Terrific lady, and uh, I really miss her. The little girl, I think she was supposed to be Leatherface's daughter. Yuckety yuck, don't talk that. You have the question, where the hell did she come from? And she was played by Jennifer Banco, who had been in Friday the 13th 7. And I think she was only 10. Basically, she could not get into the movie that she's acting in. So you worry that she's going to be scarred for life or, you know, by some of the stuff she saw on the set. If you don't poke them, then they don't leave. By now, Grandpa, for us, is mummified, but we still revere him. The patriarch who's on his way out. I don't know who kept him or how he got there. He was just kind of a sight gag, nodding back toward the early movies again. Yeah, Grandpa's still around. He's dead, but he's still around. Well, Leatherface is this sort of whacked out character who's really being controlled by his family. Somebody's escaped, go out and get him. He, he's really the enforcer. Leatherface is a child. No, I is. All children have the empowerment fantasy, and if you look at Leatherface as a child, then that is the, the only place where he is strong is where he picks up his equipment. If he was kind of childlike in the first movie, in this movie he's kind of re a rebellious teenager type. I had a guy in mind that I wanted to bring in, a guy I'd known, uh, Ari Mihailov, who had been an actor in my student film, and he was just perfect for it in terms of just the physicality of it, and he loved horror films. Look at these cannons, my man. It's very easy to create the character when you have the mask and the costume and the chainsaw in your hand and your hands are covered with blood. That goes a long, long way. It pretty much takes on an organic life of its own. It doesn't need a lot of introspection. I wish you'd call me Tex. Well, Tex is kind of the most normal looking of the bunch. Tex was played by Viggo Mortensen. Viggo went in and he screwed the audition up. You wanna go for a headshot or, or what? The audition admittedly wasn't so hot. I like liver. And they didn't cast him. Appears we get to wait a spell on you. We actually cast someone else. I'm sorry, boy. God damn it, I'm sorry. We started rehearsals and they didn't like him. Three days before shooting, two days before shooting, he booked a commercial. And Viggo goes, they just called me, I'm gonna do the movie. He was willing to do anything on our movie. All right, here we, go. Right away. we covered him in blood. He's the one who has probably the goriest death scene. Vigo's just so intense and immerses himself totally in every role. Vigo's one of those actors that he would offer you all this stuff, and it was your choice to take. And just twitch. Just twitch. Just twitch. Just twitch. Texas ambivalent sexuality, uh, because he does show up in the apron at one point, is just an echo from the first movie. He painted his fingernails. You get the feeling that the whole cowboy thing is kind of a facade. He's got a sort of a wild look, and I remember that clearly even at the time, although I had no idea who he was beyond just the fact that he was playing that role. Little did he know that we would all affiliate again later on Lord of the Rings. Our production was a traditional low-budget production. We creatively adjusted the script to meet within our financial parameters. We decided to shoot this in California, actually in the LA area, because it was cheapest. California. <laughs> I think that's one of the big decisions that was made before I came on that makes this movie kind of stand out because it's the only one to date that wasn't shot in Texas. It was easier to control and to manage the film here in California than in Texas. Everything we needed was here. For the kind of movie it was, it was a relatively short shoot. It was like a 30-day shoot. They'd already built sets. I had the designer, the cameraman, and Jeff go out to the location, and they spent days and days walking through every single shot so we could be as prepared as possible. Unfortunately, we couldn't prep too much of the second two-thirds of the movie because the set wasn't built. A lot of the interiors of the house were practical interiors because there wasn't any time to build sets and shoot them anywhere else. The bulk of the movie was shot at the Newhall Ranch, which is basically in the shadow of Magic Mountain. There's a few scenes in the movie 
where I'm not kidding, you can hear screams from the roller coaster. We were almost dead between the sets for Tour of Duty and China Beach. And so there's Hueys flying over all the time. It was like making a movie in the middle of Vietnam War. It was like 115 degree days, but we were only shooting days for like an hour and a half. I mean, it was night shoots from one end to the other. It gave us a lot of prep time in the light to prepare, to rehearse. But the minute it got dark, it was like run and gun. We're shooting a lot of true nights, night for night. And we were shooting the shortest nights of the year, which, which is just incredibly frustrating. We had a lot of bizarre issues on this. At one point, the whole Valencia area caught on fire. We were fortunate in that we were shooting nights, so the areas that did burn down, you couldn't see them. We made sure not to light them. I always remember the leather face mask from the first movie being, to me, the most realistic, because it really did look like stretched skin. I'm working with Toby Hooper right now, and I ask him where he came up with the whole idea of Leatherface. He had gotten the Leatherface concept from a guy he knew who was a medical student who actually wore a cadaver's face to a Halloween party once. And he said it was the singular most disturbing thing he had ever seen in his life. So much, in fact, that he never forgot about it. It's sort of like the same way we regard Michael Myers or Jason. It's not really what they look like underneath the mask, but what that mask characterizes. What we wanted it to do was still be identifiable as the original mask, but have a modern look. They did a lot of sketching, they did prototypes. It really became sort of a mosaic of different pieces, trying to really come up with exactly what the look was. It's a little nastier, a little harsher, a little more initially scary, I think, when you first see it. And the teeth, just the facial look of Leatherface, I think it's, is initially a little more viscerally scary than the other two movies. I like the look we ended up getting. You saw what? A chainsaw. We actually had made many saws on a very tight budget, and Bob Shea said, nope, throw them all out, we're redoing them, and he came up with this concept. And he really wanted it to stand out and to be something different. To hell with it, let's just do the ultimate Cadillac chainsaw. You like it, don't you? This is the biggest chainsaw you can get. With the three-foot bar, the big one, it's approximately 80 pounds. If anybody remembers anything about the movie, that's always one of the things they remember. To have a person hold a real chainsaw inches from your head 12 hours a day, there were times where I would drive home just like, I, you know, I could hear that thing in my sleep. From the get-go, you got the feeling they didn't really like Jeff. This was difficult, and there was always the requisite share of drama and teeth gnashing that always occurs, but I don't recall anything so severe. I would overhear conversations of them coming down hard on him for the smallest of things. Jeff, being a good director, was always trying to push the envelope and do as much as he could, and we obviously wanted to support him as much as we financially could afford. For me, it was just constant pressure. It was tremendous pressure on the production to keep things moving with very little money and very little time. When production is leaning on you, it's a whole other level of pressure, and it never goes away because they're there all the time. He handled it with us amazingly. You had a look for it that there were problems. Towards the end of the show, the studio would not extend the amount of shooting time. Sorry, Tex. We're on a pretty tight schedule today. I think they thought I'd go over budget or over schedule. Things come up and you just have to deal with them. He comes up to me and goes, I've got to see your shot list for the next week or you're fired. I sat down with Jeff, made sure he was aware that this was not a bluff, this was not a game. They would not allow this film to go over budget. I said, well, look, man, this is like week five out of six weeks. If you, if you can't understand the style I'm shooting in and what I'm doing, I don't know what to tell you. Well, the studio made their stand and threatened to fire him. I was fired. Then I got a phone call like Sunday night and I was rehired. Within those two days, they couldn't find a director that they wanted to replace me with. Jeff rose to the plate, agreed to make the necessary compromises, which is really about time, and came in and finished the movie. It's pretty amazing. Like, you think that you're, you get this directing job and that everyone's going to love you. It's just not like that at all. There's 25 people that all have their opinion, and most of which have a completely different opinion. Troubled shoot is like when films go, you know, miles over schedule and miles over budget, and people, like, have heart attacks, like on Apocalypse Now. I mean, this was just a hard shoot. We had our battles, but uh, he really maximized what was there. The film can never be yours, and that's the thing. And that was probably my mistake in the movie, trying to have it be mine when it never could be.
We're mixing the movie, let's say, late September, and it's literally coming out in a thousand some odd theaters. I'd been left alone, more or less, you know, during the editing of it. Basically, the second in command at the time hated the movie, hated the script, hated the idea of making it, hated everything about it and was, I think, very offended by it. I think I'm gonna barf. When you work at a company which's making, you know, 10 or 15 films a year, it's inevitable that there are certain films that you're not going to, like, you know, take to. There'll certainly be people who want nothing to do with a movie like this, just like there are many people who you couldn't drag to the theater to see this movie. Of course it's gonna offend people. That's kind of the raison d'etre of the horror film. Literally grab me by the lapels and go in, look, you, you know, you're mortal, you know, your body's worth maybe $8 worth of chemicals, you could be dead at any moment. It's an affront, and that's what some people love about horror films. There's a hardcore audience out there that really wants to spare no punches. They don't want you to cut away from the gory scenes. They want to see the gruesome stuff. So we had this test screening in Burbank, one of those focus group things. He got pretty good marks, the audience was digging it. The head of foreign was there, and he goes, you realize this would be banned in every country. From that moment on, it was over. The film is going to have to be released overseas, so it's, to the extent you push the envelope while directing the movie, you just know that you've got to find artful ways around it in the editing of the movie. It was so depressing. It was like, this goes, this goes, this goes, this goes. What the hell is that? What the hell is that? Is that good filmmaking? No. He knew he was obligated to deliver an R rating, so it wasn't like he was being dictated to. It was devastating to me, because I'm a very sensitive guy, too, and it was just a very difficult situation to be in. And then the MPAA got involved. The ratings board had figured out what low-budget filmmakers were doing. Canon had taken the second movie without a rating. MPA had a real chip on their shoulder anyway about this whole series, and then New Line had always had problems with the MPAA on the Nightmare movies. Our first submission to the ratings board, it got an X, and now this film had to have an R. You can't advertise it in a lot of newspapers. Lots of theaters won't play it. You make films for people to see them. But the MPA basically says, there is no way in hell this movie will ever get a rating. We went back many, many times to the board where we removed scenes, we adjusted scenes, and we even got to the point where we were pulling out a frame or two at a time. Why are you doing this? It's the inevitable process of paring down. I mean, yeah, the script, the film was violent, but we knew that when we sort of greenlit it, so there was not like, it wasn't like some shocking revelation. It's really the little girl who pulls the handle that releases the sledgehammer. <laughs> You don't even see it hit my head. When uh, Ken Foray opens fire, and at one point Tink raises his hand, Mama! the fingers come off, and they cut away from it. Mama! Mama! You don't even see any, hardly any of the blood. The girl in the beginning that has escaped Leatherface, when she gets killed, she kind of gets bisected. If you cut a film enough, it starts to bleed to death. I think Leatherface kind of turned into a bleeder. He's satisfied nobody. Mark? At the time, it felt like it was like a tons of gags, and there was so much stuff happening. Now, looking at it, it feels really tame. We missed our release date because of that. I'm not placing the blame on any one person. It was a huge conglomeration of people that collectively fucked the film up. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Leatherface is a film that has many endings. And I'm back! Well, what we did is we went back for some reshoots after doing a lot of testing. We really revived some of the characters that the audience seemed to like so that they would be around for a sequel. We had a test screen in New York, and some, like, the audience liked the character of Ken Foray. So we reshot the ending. They wanted to reshoot, and they didn't ask me to reshoot it. <laughs> All of a sudden, a guy who's dead and definitively dead comes back to life with not even saying it was a flesh wound, I mean, just like a Band-Aid on his forehead, you know, after he's been chainsawed in the head. Some tales are told, then soon forgotten, but a legend is forever. DeLuca had come up with this brilliant teaser trailer, sort of Arthurian Lady of the Lake with this gigantic sword from the stone kind of moment. It was great. It came, I think, January 12th of 1990, and it was basically just, just dumped. January used to be the month that all these problem movies were dumped. It was not a giant whopping success. The box office was disappointing. So I called my brother, who was in Los Angeles. He goes, well, it's not number one. I go, ah, I figured that. Uh, it's not number two. Ah, I figured that too. That's not number three. I go, well, really, it's not number three? Because we opened in like a thousand theaters. So literally he's going down, like it's not number five. It's not, I go, 
fuck, man, it's gotta be in the top 10. He goes, uh-uh. So if you're in a film that comes out and it's number 11, it's kind of bad, you know? It's not good. I, it, it sucks. It was not a breakaway movie as everyone had hoped it would be. Variety said, Chainsaw buzzes quietly at like 2.2 .2 million or something. And I knew that people had gone in with really high expectations and that to a degree we hadn't met those expectations. So there's always, you can always sense that disappointment. Looks like you had a little mishap. It was a big deal in the horror film circles anyway, and the first non-Toby Hooper directed sequel. So I think everyone was really primed to not like the movie. You can't make a big commercial version of something that is at its best handheld and visceral. In New York and in Westwood, there were some uh, protests. This genre generally breeds a certain amount of resistance that this is somehow an immoral activity to be making you know, exploitation horror films. Foreign territories, it was banned in many, many countries. And uh, in the biggest territory in England, it was, it was uh, in the UK, it was banned. But then I found out later that the first two were banned as well. 14 years later, I could finally say, yes, it was a positive experience. Whereas 14 years ago, uh, I would never have thought I would say that. At least we're not as bad off as those people in that body pit. Come on, it was my first feature film. It was the first film script that I ever wrote, and it got produced. I'm very proud to be in the film because no matter what people say about it, it's still a little tiny piece of like movie history. We had some good time, didn't we? It's one of the first theatrical films that I had worked on and it was very educational to watch something go from script to screen and all the numerous ways that things can get screwed up, things can turn out better than you thought or worse and just how hard it is. But when you're filming it, it's just fun and games. Everyone's laughing and joking. You're eating lunch next to the guy who's dripping blood. It was like a real family, behind the camera as well as on the camera. 